We're sitting here in, in Red Hills, which is the, the second of Durham Miners Hall. The first one is now a fruit and veg shop in, in North Road in Durham. That was built and it opened in 1880. By the end of the 19th century, this union is so big that it's got to get itself a new building. And this is it. The Miners Hall at Red Hills, Durham. You know, this is a purpose-built trade union building built by, you know, my father and his father and his father. Uh, their half pennies and pennies uh, built this building. And that wealth was distributed from this building throughout the lodges of the coal field. So if you were a lodge delegate, you would have to get an invitation to come into this building. You couldn't just rock up. And as you come up the drive, you have on your right four men who are the founders of the Durham Miners Association cast in stone. And that largely is a statement to the coal owners, saying we can have a country mansion like you have. And when you come to talk to us, this is the place you come. It is a place where I think the mindset of our early leaders would have been we are owned by the coal owners, uh, let them come and negotiate uh, with us in a building that shows our status. Now we're on a par with these people and um, you know we're not subservient to them. Every time I come in this building I catch my breath and you know I think most people do the same. It's worth considering when you look at the gala now where its origins come from. And the Durham Miners Association was started by liberal Methodists. It was built on the back of uh, religion and reform. So the Durham Miners uh, were always, in terms of most people's assessment, on the right wing of the, uh, the Labour Party. So Sam Watson takes office in 1936 as General Secretary of the Durham Miners Association. And binds the Durham Miners into uh, what you might call a reformist Labour Party position. So they were representing um, the interests of the state and even prior to nationalisation, some of the coal owners above that of their own members. What comes out of that is the gala itself is used for fundamentally two reasons. One, as a, a showcase of power, and a meeting place for the, the powerful and the influential, and this is all held in the county hotel. And then you have the mass of the people who are celebrating their heritage and culture on the street, parading with their banners, uh, their bands. And you have to remember, you know, this was a quarter of a million people and more uh, at the height of the coal field. The origins of the Durham Miners Gala when it first uh, came to Durham was, you can imagine this, is the people of the county, the coal miners, coming into Durham to claim their REITs. And it was the start of a political movement of organised labour, centred around uh, speeches. The lodges would put forward quite often uh, very radical speakers, where of course the Durham miners' leaders wanted to bring forward uh, the leaders of the Labour Party, uh, generally a more um, right-wing approach. The turning point for that really was probably uh, in the mid-80s when the Durham Coalfield went to the left in terms of leadership. When I started of course um, you know the, the, uh, the speakers from the platform would be expounding their views about workers rights and what was happening in the in the pits and pay and conditions and so on and so forth. With there no longer being any collieries of course they can't uh, go on about that. Um, instead we have uh, usually a, a left-wing platform that is expounding the values of most of the people who are you know coming onto the race course to watch them and to hear what they say and that's that's a good thing. There is more of a family atmosphere today than ever I feel. There's more of a picnic atmosphere. There is more of a you know a, an old-fashioned day out atmosphere than um, we see elsewhere and it, again you call me old-fashioned but you know it's a wonderful thing and the people seem to love it. The working class that we're looking at today is in some ways very different from the kind of working class that we see depicted in archive footage of the Durham Miners Girler. It's not all white and it's certainly not male and it's important to remember that the working class was never just male and it was never just white. 
It's vital that we remember that going forward because groups like migrants and women are going to be at the forefront of this new movement. But I think a new movement's there. I think we can see that in the fact that the gala has survived. We can see it in the many hundreds of thousands of people who've joined the Labour Party because of the hope that Jeremy Corbyn's given them. We can see it in the fact that some of these trade unions are growing in assertiveness. So I think there's a lot of room for hope. It's the pride. It's like, God, we did all this, you know, and we fought the state. We didn't win, but by God, we fought them and we give them a run for the money. I can remember bursting with pride uh, when seeing these incredible works of art and hearing this wonderful, what I would call working class music played by our, uh, our colliery bands. I would be bursting with pride and thinking, you know, I'm part of this. And uh, it was just very, very emotional. My personal experience, the experience of work all sort of celebrated and my culture celebrated on the streets of Durham as we take over the city, which to me is like, it's really emotional for me. I didn't grow up with that kind of experience of living in a mining community, but I felt it every year when I went to the gala. I felt like this is like my history, this is my heritage, and it was just, to this day, it's still my favorite day of the year, better than Christmas. <laughs> but at the big meeting, you always knew if you come from Washington, Scarborough, wherever. If you saw Eason Banner, you look around the field for the big meeting day, and you saw Eason Banner, you knew your family and your friends would be there. So you were all together. Well, you don't have to be a miner to come to the Durham Miners Gala, and I think more and more people aren't. You, know, you hear a lot more people say, I'm not from a mining background, but I come to this event and the hair stands up on the back of my neck. And until you've been, you don't quite feel that tingle and that emotion of being amongst all of that. And it's the best place from people who come from any walk of life, any job, whoever, whoever they are, wherever they work, to come together not just to march down the street and be so proud, but it's the discussion after. Because it is some beacon, I think, to people who believe in collective action and collective responsibilities and collective ways of being will want to be here. Lots of people talk about the gala as symbolising working class culture, but working class culture isn't a term that I much like because it suggests that somehow working class people only create this kind of niche culture, you know, and that there's this kind of middle and upper class out there who have proper culture, and we just have this kind of working class stuff. And if you look at what the gala is about, art, poetry, music, it's an incredible culture that comes out of everyday life and also gives expression to those things which can create very strong emotions when experienced individually, oppression, exploitation in the workplace and so on, and shows them in ways that mean that we can collectively express that anger and think about how to do something collective um, and cooperative with that anger to make the world a better place, to actually change the world in which we live. And that's an incredibly powerful kind of culture. I think today, um it is not just a Durham Miners Gala. There are lots of other unions caught up in the, uh, the wonderful sense of occasion, and they come and march in in solidarity to the miners. But, you know, to see fresh-faced youngsters from Unite and RMT and Unison, GMB, come in and uh, continue the tradition that we have always you know, being part of is, is something tremendous. Yeah.